Uh, thank you for being here. We are ready to begin. Uh, I'm going to count down from actually get started. I do want us to just take a moment of silence. Uh, I'm sure that we have all been devastated by the horrific um, tragedy uh, in uh, Uvalde, Texas, uh, the children at Robb Elementary School. So if we could just uh, have one minute of silence um, to, um, to recognize that tragedy. Thank you. The Subcommittee on Workforce Protections will come to order. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone, and uh, I note that a quorum is present. Uh, I note for the subcommittee that Mr. Courtney of Connecticut and Ms. Chu of California are permitted to participate in today's hearing with the understanding that their questions will come only after all members of the Workforce Protection Subcommittee on both sides of the aisle who are present have an opportunity to question the witnesses. The subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on examining the policies and priorities of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. This is an entirely remote hearing. All microphones will be kept muted as a general rule to avoid unnecessary background noise. Members and witnesses will be responsible for unmuting themselves when they are recognized to speak or when they wish to seek recognition. I will also ask that members please identify themselves before they speak. Members should keep their cameras on while in the proceeding. Members shall be considered present in the proceeding when they are visible on camera, and they shall be considered not present when they are not visible on camera. The only exception to this is if they are experiencing difficulty, technical difficulty, and inform the committee staff of such difficulty. If any member experiences technical difficulty during the hearing, you should stay connected on the platform, make sure you're muted, and use your phone to immediately call the committee's IT director whose number was provided in advance. Should the chair experience technical difficulty or need to step away to vote, uh, another majority member is hereby authorized to assume the gavel in the chair's absence. This is extremely, it is an entirely remote hearing, and as such, the committee's hearing room is officially closed. In order to ensure that the committee's five minute rule is adhered to, staff will be tracking uh, time uh, using the committee's field timer. The field timer will appear on its own thumbnail picture and will be named 001 underscore timer. There will be no one minute remaining warning. The field timer will show a blinking light when time is up. Members and witnesses are asked to wrap up promptly when their time has expired. Pursuant to committee rule 8C, opening statements are limited to the chair and the ranking member. This allows us to hear from our witnesses sooner and it provides all members with adequate time to ask questions. I would now like to recognize myself for the purpose of making an opening statement. Today, we are meeting to discuss the Occupational Safety and Health Administration's or OSHA's priorities and their role in protecting the health and safety of our nation's workers. Pursuant to Committee Rule 8C, opening statements are limited to the chair and the ranking member, and this allows us to hear from our witnesses sooner and provides all members with adequate time to ask questions. I now recognize myself for the purpose of making an opening statement. Today, we're meeting to discuss the Occupational Safety and Health Administration's or OSHA's priorities and their role in protecting the health and safety of our nation's workers. Since 1970, OSHA's mission has been to reduce workplace deaths, injuries, and illnesses. When OSHA was first authorized, 38 workers were killed on the job every day from acute injuries. 52 years later, that figure has fallen to 14 deaths per day in a workforce that is double the size. OSHA's critical safety standards and enforcement have directly contributed to these improvements. Nevertheless, workers continue to be injured, made ill, or killed on the job. 
fatal workplace rights have stalled after decades of decline and many causes of occupational disease remain unregulated or underregulated. And so as we have explored in various hearings and previous hearings, the spread of COVID-19 caused the worst worker safety crisis in OSHA's history and served as a stress test of OSHA's capacity to address hazards and respond nimbly. Uh, this virus also has a mind of its own, prolonging the need for robust efforts to protect America's workers. Regrettably, OSHA was missing in action throughout the Trump administration and in its handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. For example, the former administration refused to issue an emergency temporary standard that would have increased worker participation while workplace COVID-19 outbreaks claimed the lives of workers across the country. Moreover, a report from the House Select Committee on the Coronavirus Crisis found that the previous administration intentionally weakened OSHA guidance for COVID mitigation at employers' requests. Simply put, the former administration turned its back on workers to support employers' bottom line. The Trump administration's inacting, inaction on behalf of workers and, and vigorous action on behalf of corporations adds to decades of attacks by prior administrations, past Congresses, and conservative courts that left OSHA weakened. Combined, this means that the Biden administration was at a disadvantage when making worker protection a priority. Unfortunately, the consequences of prioritizing politics over hard science fails, falls on the shoulders of hardworking Americans. Thankfully, the Biden administration has taken science-based steps to address the COVID pandemic, to protect workers, and to keep our businesses open. The administration launched the largest vaccination campaign in history, working hand in hand with business with the business community, making our workers safer, help the US economy, create 6.6 .6 million jobs in 2021, the strongest job growth of any year on record, and most importantly, allowed workers to get back to work safely. Despite this historic comeback, the Biden administration has struggled to make up for OSHA's past inaction and even at times its own stumbles. Uh, notably, the administration failed to successfully implement an emergency temporary standard or an ETS, which would have increased protections for workers. After a three month delay, the first ETS was narrow in scope and only extended protections to healthcare workers. While this was an important step, it left millions of workers without adequate protection from COVID-19. Regrettably, the administration let this ETS expire and its fate is still unknown. The second ETS, the vaccine or test standard, was blocked by the conservative controlled Supreme Court. While American Rescue Plan delivered historic resources to help OSHA develop these emergency temporary standards, we remain concerned that funding has not yet been used to adequately staff OSHA and deliver on its mission. Moving forward, the administration must take meaningful science-based actions to keep workers safe on the job, including issuing an enforceable COVID-19 workplace safety standard for all workers. To ensure OSHA has the resources it needs to do its job, I am committed to working with my colleagues to update the Occupational Health and Safety Act and advance meaningful proposals introduced by my colleagues so the agency can protect workers, uh, health and safety in the 21st century workplaces. So if we care about workers, the well-being and their well-being and want to keep businesses open, then we must work together to invest in and strengthen OSHA. So thank you to Secretary Parker for your service to workers and and I look forward to a meaningful discussion. I want to now recognize the ranking member for his opening statement. Ranking member Keller, you are recognized. Thank you. Um, every American worker has the right to safely return home to their families. Republicans support common sense policies that achieve the goal of ensuring safe workplaces. And we support OSHA's enforcement of the Occupational Safety and Health Act to hold those people who don't follow it accountable. That said, committee Republicans will not shy away from holding OSHA accountable for overreach and predatory policies 
that unjustly target American job creators and their workers. This overreach is clear in President Biden's fiscal year 2023 budget, which requests an $89.4 million funding increase for OSHA to be used for overzealous enforcement and the development of new onerous regulations that will force employers out of business. The request represents an overall funding increase of 15% from the fiscal year 2022 enacted level and would add hundreds of new OSHA personnel. We are most concerned about the nearly 50% increase for OSHA's office in charge of devising and writing regulations, not to mention the 18% increase for federal enforcement. OSHA's most recent agenda includes a staggering list of 28 planned regulatory actions. This includes the regulations OSHA already has underway, including restoring provisions of the controversial Obama era electronic reporting rule, which would do nothing to improve workplace safety, but would severely burden businesses and put the personal data of their workers at risk. This strikes me as yet another attempt to place job creators in a regulatory stranglehold, which will continue to keep our economy from fully recovering from the pandemic. If OSHA gets this budget approved, it will be well on its way to fulfilling the administration's pledge to double the number of inspectors by the end of Joe Biden's presidency. Instead of spending so much of its efforts targeting job creators, OSHA should work with employers to expand its compliance assistance efforts. Compliance assistance benefits employees and job creators by protecting workers before an injury or illness can occur. Unfortunately, the Biden administration's budget places less of an emphasis on these important efforts. The Biden administration isn't shy about its anti-business agenda, and OSHA has lost a lot of trust with the American people. In the middle of a serious work, worker shortage, OSHA issued an illegal and unprecedented emergency temporary standard, or ETS, which sought to enforce or to force every American working for a company with more than 100 employees to get the COVID-19 vaccine, test weekly, or face losing their jobs. This harmed private sector businesses that were already struggling to recover from shutdowns by forcing them to choose between firing employees or facing massive penalties from the federal government. This was an impossible dilemma for businesses. And Biden's OSHA seems all too eager to keep putting job creators in that untenable position. Luckily, the Supreme Court stayed the OSHA vaccine testing mandate, finding that it was a massive overreach of executive power. Had this tyrannical vaccine mandate not been stayed, it would have exacerbated a worker shortage and further crippled our economy. Moreover, the uncertainty surrounding the mandate put undue burdens on employers who were forced to act as vaccine and testing police on behalf of the federal government. Still, OSHA did not learn from its mistakes and has made the decision to revive the controversial COVID-19 ETS for health, the healthcare industry. Our healthcare industry is already straining to meet the needs of Americans without the Biden administration demanding additional and burdensome COVID-19 requirements. Democrats and OSHA's misuse of the COVID-19 pandemic as a pretense to increase top-down federal control over the workplace is damaging to our economy and those that fuel it, America's workers and job creators. Weaponizing OSHA against employers is not the way to make workers safer. But we know that if OSHA gets its massive funding increase, America's workers and job creators can expect more of the same. We must work to keep this from happening and work to restore collaboration between the federal government and the private sector to ensure the nation's workplaces are safe and healthy. It is important that we build policies that bring small businesses and other job creators and our workforce together, not drive them apart. Thank you and I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Keller. Uh, without objection, all of the members who wish to insert written statements into the record may do so by submitting them, submitting them to the committee clerk electronically in Microsoft Word format by 5 p.m. on May 25th. I, I will now introduce the witnesses. The Honorable Douglas Parker is Assistant Secretary of Labor for Occupational Safe and Healthy and Health at the U.S. Department of Labor. He previously served in the Obama administration as Deputy Assistant Secretary 
for policy in the Department of Labor's Mine Safety and Health Administration. Mr. Parker earned a JD from the University of Virginia School of Law and a BA in History from James Madison University. Mr. Thomas M. Costa is a director on the Education Workforce and Income Security Team at the Government Accountability Office. He oversees worker protection, safety, employment, and training issues. Tom joined the GAO in October of 2005. He earned a master's degree in international relations with a focus on policy, political psychology from George Washington University. And he earned a bachelor's degree in philosophy and psychology from the University of Connecticut. Now, let me thank all of the witnesses and our instructions. We appreciate uh, uh, you for, for participating today. We look forward to your testimony. But let me remind the witnesses that we have read your written statements and they will appear in full in the hearing record. Pursuant to Committee Rule 8D and the committee practice, each of you is asked to limit your oral presentation to a five minute summary of your written statement. Before you begin your testimony, please remember to unmute your microphone. During your testimony, staff will be keeping track of time and the timer is visible to you at the witness table. So please be attentive to the time, wrap up when your time is over and remute your microphone. If any of you experience technical difficulty during your testimony or later in the hearing, you should stay connected on the platform and make sure you're muted, use your phone to immediately call the committee's IT director whose number was provided. We will let the witnesses uh, make their presentations before we move to member questions. When answering a question, please remember to unmute your microphone. The witnesses are aware of their responsibility to provide accurate information to the subcommittee and therefore we will proceed with their testimony. I'd like to first recognize Mr. Parker. Mr. Parker, you recognize for five minutes, sir. Chairman Scott and Chairwoman Adams, ranking members Fox and Keller and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today to highlight the important work of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration to protect the health, safety, and dignity of our nation. Mr. Parker, can you turn your microphone up a bit? Panel with Mr. Parker, if you could please mute and then unmute your microphone one time again and begin to speak, sir. Is that better? It's slightly better, but at the beginning of your uh, testimony, it was very clear and it immediately changed to become a lot lighter. Um, if you could mute one time, sir, and then immediately unmute your microphone and then try speaking again, sir. Thank you, panel. Sounds Mr. better. One, two, three, test. Okay. Is that better? It is. Go ahead, sir. We had stopped your time, so you won't lose your time. Okay. Well, I also want to thank members of the Education and Labor Committee for, for providing more than $100 million in supplemental funding to the American Rescue Plan to support and strengthen OSHA's enforcement and regulatory efforts and additional resources for Susan Harwood Training Grant. OSHA is determined to proactively address the needs of a changing and diverse 21st century workforce and support the Secretary of Labor's vision of good, safe, healthy jobs. Our goal at OSHA is to align one of the most fundamental priorities we all share, our health and safety and the health and safety of our families with the core values that guide how American workplaces design, supervise, and perform work and ensure an equitable approach that includes all workers in that business. To achieve this, OSHA must meet current workforce workplace safety and health hazards, as well as emerging threats. That requires us to first rebuild the agency's workforce from record low staffing levels, and we've begun to do that. OSHA made more than 270 hires between August 2021 and April 22, including 156 inspectors and 32 whistleblower investigators. OSHA must continue to respond to the threat of COVID-19. OSHA is working to finalize a permanent COVID-19 standard to protect healthcare workers but we have not waited for that standard to act. In March of this year, 
we launched an enforcement initiative to significantly increase OSHA's presence in healthcare. And since the beginning of this administration, OSHA and its state partners have conducted more than 2,500 COVID-19 healthcare inspections. OSHA continues to inspect other high-risk industries, investigate COVID whistleblower complaints, and conduct outreach and education to help employers and employees be better prepared. OSHA is also looking ahead, using our rulemaking tools to ensure workers are protected against unregulated hazards and finding ways to address these hazards in the meantime. First, to ensure we're ready for future outbreaks and pandemics, we are developing an infectious disease standard for highest risk workplaces. Second, OSHA began rulemaking to develop a standard to address the growing threat of occupational heat illness and it has engaged with stakeholders early in the process to help craft a protective and workable rule. But as with COVID, we're not waiting to act. We recently lost, launched a nationwide initiative to educate employers and for the first time, proactively inspect workplaces for heat hazards. Our third major rulemaking priority is advancing a standard to protect healthcare workers from the epidemic of workplace violence. But again, even without a rule, we have been able to successfully prosecute several important workplace violence cases to ensure healthcare facilities address workplace violence hazards. Enforcement remains a key component of the agency's worker protection strategy. OSHA is increasing the number of inspections and bringing more cases with enhanced penalties where it is warranted by employer conduct. We are committed to using all the tools available to us, including criminal and other enhanced judicial relief for those employers who flaunt safety standards and put workers in danger. In light of infrastructure investments spurred by the bipartisan infrastructure law, OSHA continues its focus on construction hazards, including health risks, and is revitalizing an initiative to, vul to protect vulnerable temporary workers. We're also increasing staffing and filling the long vacant director position for our whistleblower program. Compliance assistance and training are also key tools for OSHA and critical for our vision of health and safety as a core value in workplaces. The agency is dedicated to helping small and medium-sized businesses in particular take advantage of our free on-site assistance to develop a safety and health management program. Last fiscal year, OSHA programs trained over 1.1 million workers and OSHA has engaged with employers to help them address hazards that have historically been overlooked, such as mental health awareness, in particular, suicide prevention and substance abuse. I wanna again thank the subcommittee for your continued interest and support in making sure workers have the safety and health protections they need and deserve. We owe this to every worker and family in America. I'm now happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Uh, I want to recognize now, uh, Mr. Costa, you have five minutes, sir. Thank you, Chairwoman Adams, Republican Leader Keller, and members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss OSHA's preparedness to handle emergent risks. I will highlight one, enforcement challenges OSHA faced and enforcement actions it's taken during the COVID pandemic. Two, new standards OSHA developed or used to protect workers from COVID, and three, OSHA's efforts to obtain injury and illness data from employers. My testimony is based primarily on prior GAO reports and updated information provided by OSHA. As the COVID pandemic passes the two-year mark, the disease continues to pose new challenges, and OSHA's ability to help protect workers from COVID and its preparedness for a future crisis remain concerns. OSHA helps ensure safe and healthy conditions for workers by setting standards, conducting inspections, and investigating reports of injuries, illnesses, and fatalities, among other efforts. This brings me to my three discussion points. First, to support COVID-related safety, OSHA used voluntary guidance, existing standards, such as those related to the use of respirators, and a healthcare-focused emergency temporary standard. However, OSHA faced challenges with applying existing standards to COVID cases because these standards do not contain provisions specifically targeting COVID. When no standard applies to a particular hazard, OSHA can cite violations based on its general duty clause. However, violations of the general duty clause require substantial time to collect the documentation to support a citation. Moreover, OSHA must issue a citation within six months of any violation, and OSHA sometimes didn't know about possible violations for months, which limited OSHA's ability to cite general duty clause violations. When OSHA began enforcing its COVID healthcare ETS in July of 2021, it became an important tool OSHA used to protect workers. From February 2020 through December 2021, 
OSHA received almost 22,000 COVID-related reports of illnesses and fatalities. They conducted over 3,000 COVID-related inspections and cited over 1,000 violations, only 25 of which were general duty clause violations, and proposed over $7 million in penalties. My second point concerns the new standards OSHA developed or used during the pandemic. From February 2020 through June 2021, OSHA primarily relied on voluntary employer guidance and existing standards for its COVID-related assistance and enforcement. In June 2021, OSHA issued the COVID ETS for the healthcare industry that I just mentioned. And in November, OSHA also issued a COVID vaccination and testing ETS for larger employers. To issue an ETS, OSHA must determine that the employees are being exposed to a grave danger. For example, in the COVID healthcare ETS, OSHA cited the severe health consequences of COVID and the high risk of transmission in the workplace as the basis for their determination. However, in December, December, OSHA announced it was no longer enforcing most of the COVID healthcare ETS because it anticipated that a final rule could not be completed in the six months contemplated by the OSHA Act. And in January of this year, OSHA withdrew the vaccination and testing ETS as an enforce enforceable standard after a Supreme Court decision halted its implementation. OSHA is still working on a permanent COVID healthcare standard and is also developing an infectious disease standard through the rulemaking process. However, our past work found that to issue a new standard, it takes more than seven years on average and can take up to 19 years. OSHA began working on its current infectious disease standard over 11 years ago. My third point concerns employer reporting of required injury and illness data. We found employers did not report this data on more than 50% of their establishments for 2016 through 2018 although the reporting has increased slightly in recent years. OSHA uses this data to help identify establishments with the highest injury and illness rates and target some for planned inspections. Without good data, they may not be inspecting the most dangerous establishments. Moreover, OSHA has limited procedures to encourage employers to report injury and illness summary data. For example, in 2019, OSHA sent reminder postcards to 27,000 of the nearly 220,000 employers that potentially didn't report. OSHA got less than a 20% response rate. Similarly, OSHA issued fewer than 300 citations over an almost two year period for failing to report this data. As a result of our work, we recommended that OSHA assess various challenges related to resources, communication and guidance in response to the pandemic. We also recommended that OSHA evaluate its current procedures for ensuring that employers report required injury and illness data. Both recommendations remain open. In conclusion, OSHA faced challenges in enforcing various standards during the pandemic and struggles to get quality data to identify those establishments with the highest injury and illness rates. Without more action, OSHA may not be best prepared for the next crisis. This completes my statement. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Costa. Uh, under committee rule 9A, we will now question witnesses under the five minute rule. I'll be recognizing the subcommittee members in seniority order. Uh, again, to ensure that the member's five-minute rule is adhered to, staff will be keeping track of time. Uh, please be attentive to the time and wrap up when your time is over and remove, remute your microphone. Uh, I recognize myself as chair for five minutes now. Uh, Mr. Parker, uh, I'd like to focus on the COVID standards. Uh, during the o Obama administration, OSHA started work on an infectious disease standard that would have covered healthcare employers. But the Trump administration killed that and, and it chose not to develop an emergency temp te temporary standard on COVID-19. Uh, did these choices put OSHA on the back foot when President uh, Biden ordered the agency to protect workers? Ms. Sparkle. Thank you. I do believe that you know, more work has been done to complete an infectious disease standard uh, that, that OSHA would have been in a better position to address COVID within the scope of, of that rule. In California, there, there is an, an infectious disease standard. I was the chair of, or I was the chief of Cal OSHA prior to taking this position. And so from my experience, I know that that the state was in a much better position to address infectious disease in hospitals with, with the scope of that rule. Um, there were standards in place, there were um, plans in place that hospitals were required to have. Our 
staff were trained on it, there was a mechanism uh, and there were clear expectations of hospitals. It certainly wasn't perfect and, and um, hospitals certainly were not prepared for the scale of the pandemic that uh, we all experienced, but it certainly put Calais in a better position to be able to uh, enforce basic infectious disease controls because of the existence of a sandwich. Okay. Well, let me let me turn to some more uh, current matters. Um, OSHA published the healthcare ETS last June. Uh, the OSHA Act requires OSHA to develop a final standard within six months, but OSHA failed to meet that deadline. Uh, OSHA was given $100 million in additional funding through the American Rescue Plan for COVID-related work. Did OSHA hire any new um, FTEs for its standards office so that it could work on more than one major standard at the same time? We have been using ARP funding to hire staff and to hire contractors to work on, on, on COVID-19 uh, standard making. We hired about a dozen FTE during that time period. Um, and some of those have been working on, um, on, the, on the standard. It's a little bit difficult to um, bring people on, on on a project that's um, happening on, on such an accelerated scale uh, and, and, um, and rapidly incorporate them into the project planning process. Uh, our, our teams had a plan uh, that they were executing that made it a little bit difficult to grow. But um, I think that, um, you know, they've done it. I have to say our team's done an incredible job under the circumstances of moving quickly. Okay, let me, right, let me move on. You know, from where I sit and from where many of us sit, it's difficult to understand how OSHA could have this level of, of resources and not be able to produce two standards at the same time. Uh, what, what were the challenges uh, that kept OSHA from being able to issue and enforce these standards in a timely manner? Um, can you give me a quick answer to that? What, what were those challenges? Well, um, you know, part of that, you know, occurred before I was confirmed as, as um, assistant secretary, but I've done some review and I think that, um, you know, there are, there are simply certain, you know, bottlenecks in the process that make it, make it challenging in order to make it sure that a rule is meeting all of the required legal standards to make sure that it's sufficiently supported by the evidence. You know, it requires, um, you know, a great amount of work and um, well, giving the time that it takes to hire people, um, it, it frankly just would have been difficult to gear up quickly enough to move faster and, and sort of move the needle significantly with hiring in such a short period. Um, we are now hiring, we're continuing to hire, and we've certainly made the funding requests to expand our rulemaking team so that we're better prepared in the future. Uh, but um, it's simply challenging to invest those kinds of resources for such a quick turnaround uh, as the one that, that our, um, our task is part of today. All right, thank you, sir, I'm out of time. And so we're going, I'm going to uh, move on now and recognize the ranking member for the purpose of que questioning the witnesses. Uh, Mr. Kelly, you are recognized. Thank you. Um, and, and my question is for uh, Mr. Parker. Uh, following OSHA's rebuke of the Supreme Court, the agency was forced to rescind its vaccine and testing emergency temporary standard. In its notice to rescind the ETS, however, the agency chose to keep the measure as a proposed rule, leaving the door open to yet another uh, tyrannical vaccine mandate in the future. So, Mr. Parker, why are you keeping the vaccine mandate alive after OSHA's loss at the Supreme Court? Thank you, Reverend Member Keller. They, the, by operation of law, when an emergency temporary standard is issued, it functions as a proposed rule. The Supreme Court ruled that the emergency temporary standard, the, the, the vaccine and testing rule, uh, was not likely to prevail on the merits in the, in the lower court. And so um, we withdrew that rule, but as a matter of law, the proposed rule continues to be in place. Not unlike other, other proposals that we've had on the regulatory agenda for a long time. 
we don't have any plans to, um, to, to move forward with a vaccine and testing rule, but that's just a function of how the, you know, how the, uh, at this time, and you know, we haven't really given it a lot of consideration because it was just um, a function of how the law works that it continues to be in place. So I, I guess just to follow up, uh, employers and should employers and workers be concerned that there, there may be another ill-advised or illegal vaccine mandate promulgated from the agency in the future, or is that pretty much dead? No, I, I, we don't We don't have any plans to, to move forward on the vaccine. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Parker, prior to President Biden uh, taking office, OSHA had rarely used its emergency rulemaking authority, which allows the agency to bypass critical regulatory safeguards like soliciting public comment. Now, OSHA has issued two emergency temporary standards in President Biden's first year in office. Uh, the vaccine mandate and the healthcare industry ETS. Should the regulated community expect this to be standard operating procedure at OSHA during the Biden administration? I, I, I think, uh, Ranking Member, you have to keep in mind the scale of the pandemic and what we were up against as, as, a, as a nation. More than a million people have died in this pandemic. It was a massive, um, a massive tragedy that required a massive emergency response. And both of those um, emergency rulemaking activities that you're referring to were directly related to COVID. We would address through the emergency rulemaking process, emergency where it's appropriate, but I don't think that you can extrapolate from this unprecedented um, scale of, of, of a pandemic. Uh, that, that, that that's the kind of thing that we're going to do on a consistent basis. Because, you know, it is a relatively high standard that we have to meet to this point. Well, I, I would just, uh, you know, in that, and so I, do you believe it's important to give the regulated community the opportunity to weigh in on OSHA's regulations? Well, absolutely. Okay. And not only is it important for them, it's important for us because it, it allows us to make a better job. Yeah, I would just say, I, I know we're all talking about the pandemic. Uh, you know, we know that, that during the pandemic, when we had the first day of session, Speaker Pelosi had a COVID-19 booth set up on the House floor. So people that were positive for COVID-19 could come in and vote for her speaker. Now, I don't know of any business that would have done that if they needed somebody to come into work, allowed them to come in knowing they were positive for COVID and having to go through the entire building to get to an area. So when, when people are talking about the pandemic and, and uh, employers, right, I think they need to talk about the actions that have been taken by some of the Democrats in Washington, D.C. that didn't put the federal employees first and didn't, weren't concerned for their safety, yet they want to demonize the people for which we work, America's job creators and the people that go to work every day. I just wanted to make that point. Uh, and my last question, Mr. Parker, uh, we've consistently heard committee Democrats demonize employers and question their commitment to ensuring that workers go home to their families safe and healthy every night. Based on my experience with employers in my district, and I know I worked in a factory, I know these statements that employers do not care about the workplace, workplace safety is entirely wrong. So with that, is OSHA doing, what is OSHA doing to cooperatively work with employers to expand its compliance assistance efforts, which benefit employees by protecting them before an injury or illness can occur? We're actively engaged in, in that work, working with small businesses. Um, you know, we and, and we requested significant funding in 23 to expand our compliance system. Thank you, the gentleman's time is the gentleman's out of time. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to uh, now recognize Mr. Takano of California. Uh, you recognize sir for five minutes. Mr. Takano on the platform. Yeah, Adams, I cannot. I cannot confirm that Mr. Takano is currently present or available on the platform. Okay, uh, let uh, let me move on to Mr. Norcross of New Jersey. Mr. Norcross, you are recognized for five minutes, sir. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and certainly for holding this uh, hearing today. OSHA, 1970, to reduce injuries, sickness, and death. In my uh, career, which started in construction as an electrician, we always went to work each and every day with the premise we're going to come home the way we went in. 
healthy and alive. But unfortunately, three times in my career, I was on a job where someone didn't come home. They were killed on the job. You will never forget that. That made such a profound difference in the way I view workplace safety. When you see somebody die in front of you, you will never forget it. So the idea that giving additional money to keep up with all the pressures of a workforce, in this case, OSHA, somehow hurts employers. Let me make this absolutely clear. Increasing the money to OSHA will make sure that more people come home the way they went to work, alive. And let's be clear, profits do not become, do not come before people. I've been on jobs, I understand this. So let's just put that aside and thank OSHA for what they've done. Help more people come home each and every day. We can work together on this and we need to. So, Mr. Secretary, let me ask you a question about something that I found astounding. And I, again, I've been involved this my entire career. Recent reports by the Strategic Organizing Center and the New Jersey Policy Perspective found based on analysis of OSHA's records that in 21, the last year available, Amazon workers' serious injury rate comprise all of almost 55% of all serious injury rates in New Jersey. That's astounding. We sent over a letter and I asked the Madam Chairwoman who entered into the record for you to look into this, for OSHA to look into what is going on. You know, sometimes we see some changes and the numbers coming in, but this is really remarkable. Can OSHA commit to opening an investigation into the issues that potentially are going on at Amazon, at these warehouses. Mr. Secretary. Thank you, excuse me. Um, thank you for that question. You know, the, the data that you're referring to, uh, I believe is, is actually company data. And it underscores the fact that, you know, it's only because of our 2016 rule that, that requires certain employers to submit to OSHA their uh, electronic injury and illness rates that we're able to see, um, see the kinds of patterns or results that may happen with, within a particular industry or a company or at an individual establishment. And, and, and it gives you a sense of why we think that that expanding that rule to give us more information, to give the public more information, the workers more information is just so important so that we have a much better understanding of, of what injury and illness rates look like in this country. With respect to committing to a particular investigation, you know, we don't talk in advance about any kind of investigation or inspections. And um, you know, we're, we're very careful not to. Not okay. To, so, not to do that, but but we take the the um, issues you raise very seriously in the letter. Well, thank you. So, two points we want to make: yes, this is information provided by Amazon to OSHA. We got the information from the OSHA, so this is not some numbers that are coming out of left field. And we understand about making it publicly. So, let me rephrase that: if in a state, a company that had less than 10% of the workforce, had 55% of the injuries. Would OSHA think that's a little bit unusual and look at it as an anomaly that something might be going on? Hypothetically. That's certainly the kind of information that would be worthy of inquiry. Uh, I, I mean, I think we should say it. Well, we appreciate that. And, and again, you know, the idea that employers are intentionally doing this I understand that doesn't happen, but let's be absolutely clear. When people die and violations have been, or citations are ordered, that means something went wrong. And at the end of the day, we want to make sure everybody comes home the way they want to work. And with that, thank I yield back to Mike. Thank you, Mr. No Cross. Uh, thank you. Uh, Representative Miller Meeks, you are recognized for five minutes now. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Keller, and I thank our witnesses for appearing. Um, you know, this is an interesting hearing, uh, especially after OSHA having been given millions of dollars of the uh, COVID-19 funding to have a uh, vaccine mandate struck down. And I can speak on this as uh, both a small business owner, uh, as a uh, healthcare professional, as a former director of the Department of Public Health, uh, where some of these policies uh, were misguided. Um, the committee has a responsibility to ensure that hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars that the agency received in discretionary and supplemental funding during the COVID-19 pandemic has been spent wisely. Mr. Parker, does OSHA have an estimate of how many taxpayer dollars were wasted in pursuing vaccine and testing mandate, which the administration knew was going to be ruled unconstitutional? They even remarked upon that. And given that the rule was ultimately rebuked as illegal by the Supreme Court, do you believe that the federal funding that OSHA received to protect workers from COVID-19 could have been better spent? I don't, I don't have at my, uh, my fingertips the, um, you know, an accounting of the, of the dollars that were used specifically for that rule. It's not necessarily how we do our accounting on a, on a rule by rule basis. Um, but it's something that uh, I can I can see how much how much information we can get and provide it to you subsequent to the hearing. I think it would be very helpful for us to know where there's where those dollars were spent and if there are dollars that are unspent uh, that could be uh, returned uh, or utilized in a different manner for you to fulfill your mission. Um, I think there are many of us physicians, uh, former directors of public health, people in the public health sphere who felt that immunity was the issue that we were trying to get at, which protects ourselves and protects others. But we never heard the concept of immunity. We just heard uh, vaccine mandate uh, and uh, terminating people when there's a labor shortage and our labor participation rate is not where it was prior to the pandemic, uh, that creating uh, further uh, hurdles, I think, for those in the healthcare field. Um, I'm also concerned about President Biden's budget request to increase agency uh, staffing dramatically. Workplace injury and illness rates have been steadily decreasing for decades. Uh, let me just show this little graph. I'm not sure if everyone can see it, but it shows that the numbers of uh, uh, non-fatal occupational uh, injuries and illnesses uh, have decreased almost by half from 2002 to 2020. I can get those exact figures for you. So given this positive trend, which we all welcome, we want people to be able to go to work, to be safe, certainly as a uh, former uh, employer and a small business owner, uh, my employees were my greatest asset uh, and I uh, treated them as such. Uh, and so given the positive trend and is the request for increased staffing so that OSHA can write additional onerous regulations and ramp up enforcement more than rec record, uh, you know, such as record keeping violations. And I have seen this time and time again as a justification for increased staffing. You should and OSHA should be partners with our business owners and especially our small business owners to allow maximum uh, safety, but also to allow those businesses to continue to operate. Thank you, Congressman. I, I should first note that, you know, OSHA, a lot of people think about enforcement when they think of OSHA, but there are many facets to the work that OSHA does. It's not only enforcement, and remote, but we do a considerable amount of compliance assistance. Uh, you know, we, we reach out to thousands of employers every year. We train more than a million um, workers through um, both direct training and, and support of, of um, private sector trainers. And so there's considerable other work that we do. Um, you know, your, the graph that you showed did show um, significant improvement from the time that the OSH Act was um, developed or enacted uh, back in 1970. At that time, there were about um, 1,100 uh, co-shows, inspectors, and we're down below, um, most in the last fiscal year, below 800. So, and, and if you look at that trend line, it has gotten flat. So uh, I think strongly that when we still have more than 5,000 people dying at work every year, many thousands more injured, um, it's worth more of that, uh, you know, a factor even higher that that are affected by occupational illness. But if we want so to get if, to if I may, level, if I may, sir, if I may correct you, the graph that I showed you was not from 1970. 
it was from 2002 to 2020. And the number of uh, workplace fatalities in 2020 was 43, 49, not more than 5,000. So I might, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying that you're, uh, you're going to help with compliance, you're going to help with training. So is it correct to say that the majority General of this funding is not, is not going to go to regulatory and punitive measures, it is going to go to compliance and training? The gentlelady's time is up. Um, thank you so much. I yield back my time. And thank you very much. I'd like to recognize uh, Representative Stevens. Uh, you have five minutes, ma'am. Well, um, allow me to oh, allow me to just say, Madam Chair, I am so grateful to you for having this hearing, examining the policies and priorities of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, in part because the, uh, the legislation that in, in that was enacted in 1970 was certainly very important. And now we find ourselves, uh, you know, half a century later uh, in still in the middle of a global pandemic, looking at the ways in which we can modernize and improve. And that's what today's hearing is about. So often in the Congress, I, we run into these very type of matters, how we are operating off of laws that were written half a century ago that need to be tweaked, that need to be modernized, that need to be improved. Tweak might be too docile of a term. So Doug Parker, our Assistant Secretary of Labor here, Mr. Parker, Secretary Parker, um, in the OSHA budget's justification, it mentions increasing the diversity of the agency's workforce by creating an apprenticeship program that will develop safety technicians into entry-level co-shows and recruiting for those positions from HBCUs, MSIs, Veterans Networks, and other organizations. Can you explain for us, sir, how the creation of the apprenticeship program will help OSHA increase diversity in its workforce and fulfill its mission to protect workers? I'd be happy to. First of all, let me note that we're already working hard to, um, to increase the diversity of this organization. Um, you know, we've done a considerable amount of hiring. We actively work to recruit at HBCUs and, and uh, through associations uh, you know, made up of, of um, you know, workers of color, women. And so, you know, we're actively working to do that. We've also worked recently very closely with the Office of Personnel Management to, um, to obtain uh, for a limited period direct hire authority so that we can go to, to uh, conferences, we can, we can go to colleges and we can virtually hire on the spot uh, so that we can really build up our ranks and, and do it quickly with the inspector. Yeah. With respect to the apprenticeship program, this is really to get non-traditional folks who maybe don't have all the degrees, who, you know, who, who didn't take organic chemistry to become an, an I-8, for example who we can bring in because they have on the job experience, they have a different set of experiences that is still extremely relevant for the strong work of, of OSHA. They can come onto the, you know, they can come in as a safety tech and we can train them on the job and give them the skills they need to. Um, yeah. to well, on the job training is phenomenal, Mr. Secretary. And, you know, we really want to applaud you. And, you know, on a separate but more urgent note, um, the Surgeon General released an advisory uh, on healthcare worker burnout and resignation because the healthcare system is becoming more fragile and less able to serve the people as workers in the system get driven to the edge, uh, you know, just to the I've worked too much uh, and I don't, you know, I don't know if I can actually fulfill the mission of my job. So organizations communities and policies must prioritize protecting health workers from workplace violence, right? That's a point I want to stress. Quote, in the national survey among healthcare workers in mid-2021, eight out of 10 experienced at least one type of workplace violence during the pandemic, and two-thirds have been verbally threatened, and one-third of nurses reporting an increase in violence compared to the previous year. This is legislation we've also worked on as a committee. So when can we expect OSHA to follow up on the Surgeon General's recommendation, um, Secretary Parker, and update its policies by publishing a proposed rule on work place violence? So um, the next step in that process, we, you know, our priority right now is to finish the COVID-19 rule and to work on an infectious disease in healthcare, but it's not keeping us from doing other work. So this fall, we'll take on the next step of, uh, of the workplace violence standard. We'll be having the, 
meeting to do this ABRIFA process, the, the Small Business Fairness Act process to hear from small businesses that would be affected by that, that rule. So, um, so that's coming up in the fall. I don't have an exact date in front of me on a proposed rule, but we're working, um, you know, we'll be working very diligently on that. Yeah, uh, well, we'll, we'll we do whatever it. we can, sir, to support you to get that addendum going and certainly appreciate the, the dialogue and, and the service to the nation. And with that, Madam Chair, I'm yielding back. Thank you for the hearing. Thank you very much. Uh, we want to recognize now, uh, Representative Steele, uh, you are now recognized. Five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Ranking Member. Uh, local small businesses need consistency from government and OSHA, even during the pandemic. When I was chair of the Orange County Supervisors at the start of pandemic, I established the Orange County Business Recovery Ad Hoc Committee to establish a responsible and effective plan to mitigate the pandemic. Mixed messaging from the federal government hurt small businesses and our community very much. Austin Secretary Parker, new OSHA regulations and aggressive actions can have major costs on small business. Will OSHA work with the employers to ensure fair and responsible inspection and enforcement policies? Will OSHA focus on collaborative efforts with employers to make worker play, workplace safer? Do you believe in a proactive approach to safety where OSHA can build trust with local businesses? I absolutely believe that. Um, one of the things that that I believe that we have to do as an agency is help establish safety and health as a core value. Um, the OSHAC puts the responsibility on employers to provide a safe and healthy workplace. And yes, it gives us responsibility to set standards and things and thus enforcement, uh, but it also provides that we are to provide assistance and guidance uh, and, and to help, help uh, businesses, particularly small businesses. Uh, and, and we're committed to that. You know, one of the things that we want to promote uh, in this administration is the expansion of safety and health management programs so that it, employers are really taking on um, the full, as full aspects of doing a hazard assessment in their workplace, proactively working to make sure that there aren't hazards in the workplace, engaging with their workers, having worker participation, and building those programs. It's often quite intimidating for a small business to think about doing all those things. So we're working very hard to think about how we can um, provide small businesses the, the tools to start taking the first steps, right? To take up a progressive approach to where they can, through building blocks, or develop aspects of a safety and health management program, you know, a, a worker health and safety program in their workplace. They can start the process, they can build from there. It will be manageable. It's not, you know, 200 pages long. And so we'll, we hope to have more information on that in the future. We're, we're, some of that is in development, but we're very much committed to making sure that small businesses, you know, have the support that they need. And I'll, I'll remind, remind you and all that are listening, you know, OSHA provides free on-site consultation with small and medium businesses who seek out our help to, um, to improve their safety and health program or to address hazards in their workplace. So, so um, employers can do that. I'm working to build our program. You know, we are hiring more people to do that work. And it's my hope that uh, if we can continue to get more funding, that we can make sure that we have um, a compliance assistance office, a consult a a compliance consultant, you know, in every field office, who can help um, businesses um, with that approach. So my next question is, how you know those regulations and tougher, uh, you know, guidelines? How you reach out to these small businesses? Because I own small businesses and I actually work with small businesses in my community. How you reach out? Because that regulation's been changing so much. And then these guidelines just keeps coming in. How you reach out? How are you gonna take this, um, you know, for small business seriously and how, you know, their concerns, how you listen to them and then Im implement these regulations? You know, I think that that's an interesting question and an interesting challenge because one of the things that I've 
found here is that our people are committed and do a great job of doing outreach and we, we have social media and we have these channels of communication. We're often reaching the, the kind of same people over and over again. I think there's another group of, of business people out there and the pandemic has laid this bare that we can do a better job of reaching out to. I think the key is through organizations like the one that you were involved with in Orange County, getting more engagement with these associations who can be strong conduits to local businesses to get out the message on our behalf and on, on for the benefit of themselves and workers. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Parker. You know what, uh, I have two more questions, but I'm gonna submit in writing. Thank you, Madam Chair, I yield back. And thank you very much. I want to recognize now the chair of the uh, Committee on uh, Education and Labor, uh, Mr. Scott. Uh, Chairman Scott, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I wanna thank both of our witnesses for being with us today. Uh, Mr. Costa, you've been studying the delays in getting um, OSHA standards um, uh, implemented. I know beryllium and other airborne uh, diseases uh, standards took decades. Uh, basically, what's, why does it take so long? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, the, setting the standards, uh, OSHA has a higher um, threshold of, of, uh, of procedural requirements than most other agencies. Um, in addition, it's, it's faced, um, as we've seen recently, rigorous standards of judicial review, um, and then also shifting priorities over time. So, for example, we've seen uh, that the average amount of time it takes to establish a rule is, is over seven years and can be as long as 19 years, which was for um, scaffolding in construction. Um, the, the standard for respiratory protection, which OSHA cited fairly relatively frequently, during COVID took 15 plus years. Um, so the, it's, it's a big challenge for them to get something done quickly because of the amount of- Do you have, uh, do you have, do you have recommendations on how that, obviously that's not uh, satisfactory. Do you have any recommendations how we can expedite the, um, uh, the proceedings? Uh, you know, we did not look specifically at recommendations for that. We did talk about the need for additional consultation with other stakeholders, which I know for like NIOSH uh, back in our 2012 report uh, that looked at this specifically. And we did close that recommendation because uh, OSHA did increase its, its collaboration with NIOSH. Uh, but we have not looked more recently at the, at the process to see if there's other steps that OSHA could take uh, to increase um, the speed with which it gets standards out. Well, you mentioned uh, litigation. Um, one of the things we learned from the Supreme Court's decision in the uh, vaccine or test emer emergency temporary standard seemed to require explicit authorization from Congress um, to, um, to implement some of these um, regulations. Looking forward, is there, are there areas we need better legislation to help OSHA um, implement new standards? Um, I, I, I'm sure there, there are, sir. I would defer to Assistant Secretary Parker for specifics as to where the, the administration thinks it needs additional legislation. Assistant Parker, look, looking forward, I mean, these things, um, you know, you don't want to start working on this when the emergency starts. Are you looking forward to seeing what we need to be doing to um, um, legislatively? We'd be happy to uh, consult with um, Congress and provide technical assistance on uh, suggestions for how um, the process might be streamlined. Um, okay. well, you said you're working on violence, the workplace violence. Do you need any legislation in that area? Um, you know, we're, we're operating, um, we, you know, we're going forward with the standard based on our usual processes. If there's interest in, Congress in a, in a bill, and I know that there have been some bills introduced on that. Um, you know, if there's interest in how a, how a bill would complement the, the rulemaking process, we'd have to be happy to provide assistance, technical assistance on that. Okay. And well, I, believe, Mr. I, I believe there have been some discussion previously. Mr. Barker, you obviously don't have time to uh, uh, to inspect each each workplace. I think right now, if you with the funding you have, you can get to each workplace every hundred years. One way to deal with that 
is to check uh, records to target the appropriate um, places for um, for danger. What are the challenges in relying uh, on uh, record keeping? I know a lot of people don't keep good records and what can be done about it? Well, uh, we're always gonna be in using, in using employer provided records, there's always gonna be a limitation on um, you know, dependent, it's always going to be dependent on how good the record keeping is and whether uh, they've been submitted. So certainly the starting point, as, um, as the GAO has suggested, is making sure that we're uh, doing what we can to um, make sure that all employers who have to um, report do report. Um, the second thing that we need to do is, is um, expand the type of data that we're collecting. Uh, when employers have significant data, they're already required to collect and obtain and detain in case there's an inspection, but it's sitting in a file in their office unless we come in and look at it. So, you know, in this modern age, with everything's so dependent on data and, um, you know, we use data for all kinds of applications to improve efficiency and productivity and, and um, you know, the efficacy of programs. Looking at that more would be a way that, you know, look, getting that data and being able to to well, analyze my, it my, 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 time, my time has expired. If you could give us some recommendations on that. And as you talk about legislation, uh, give us some information about what you did in California in terms of airborne infectious diseases and infectious diseases generally that we might want to replicate on a federal level. That'd be appreciated. And with that, Madam, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me recognize uh, Representative Chu. You recognize five minutes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, yes, Mr. Parker, thank you so much for um, being here today and for the department's uh, timely attention to preventing heat related illnesses and fatalities. Uh, nearly two decades ago in Central California, Mr. Asuncion Valdivia was a farm worker who was picking grapes for 10 hours straight in 105 degree temperatures when he dropped over. Soon thereafter, he died at the age of 53 of a preventable heat stroke. And that's why in 2005, in partnership with United Farm Workers, I introduced the country's first heat stress related uh, protection standards in California. And I'm proud that the total number of fatal heat related illnesses that are reported to the state OSHA agency have decreased since this implementation. Despite California's success, industry claims that these types of regulations can be too burdensome for employers to comply with and that, no, uh, and that new regulations of any kind can increase prices on their goods. But California's example shows that these claims are incorrect. My state is one of the large and small and has proven that you can protect workers and have a thriving agricultural sector. And I've heard from so many workers in California who've told me what uh, guaranteed shade and water breaks and rest periods means to them. Uh, it's literally life-saving. But while many employers act in good faith to protect their workers, it's clear that we need enforceable federal regulations to ensure bad actors are not allowed to exploit hardworking laborers. So Mr. Parker, I introduced a bill that addresses this issue. It's HR 2193 the Asuncion Valdivia Heat Illness and Fatality Prevention Act. This bill directs OSHA to issue a safety or health standard on excessive heat that includes among other protections, allowing workers to have a minimum paid break in cool spaces, access to water and limited exposure to heat. If we were to pass this legislation, how would it enhance or facilitate OSHA's current work on a heat standard and the agency's other heat related enforcement activities such as the National Emphasis Program. Uh, how would such legislation ensure that these protections exist beyond the current administration? Thank you. I, you know, I, I would, um, I certainly want to review some of the provisions a little more closely. I know that, you know, I have, I'm familiar with the bill and I know that it um, follows uh, some of the um, elements of the California standard that follow some of the kind of best practices that, um, that organizations like uh, NIOSH and the uh, you know, American Conference of Government Industrial Identity have suggested. And so, 
um, I think that there are certainly um, you know, valuable elements of that of that legislation that we can look at in um, in our own rulemaking. Um, you know, I I would would interact with our current standard making process that I'm that um, that we're doing. With, I, you know, I I think we'd have to look at it a little more closely and get back to you on that. But we certainly share the absolutely share the vision that's expressed in that bill. Um, not only in terms of the importance of addressing this issue, the recognition of this as a significant hazard to workers, not only at workers who are working outside, um, like the um, farm worker that, that um, tragically died, um, that the bill is named after, but also um, the significant number of people who are working indoors and affected by excessive heat and heat illness. And so um, we certainly um, wholeheartedly um, support the, you know, the spirit of the bill and the need to address this issue and to follow um, you know, the, you know, follow the science in terms yeah. of the appropriate oh. control. And and Mr. Parker, I was uh, concerned about timeliness too, uh, since one of the topics we've been exploring is how long it takes OSHA to get a final standard produced. Uh, I was gratified to see that OSHA published an advance notice of proposed rulemaking, but do you think OSHA can publish a final standard by spring of 2024? Um, I, th I think that um, could be challenging. Um, I, uh, it just depends on the rate at which the, the rulemaking goes. So, um, so, so the, the COVID rulemaking that we've had to go through and the prioritization of infectious disease so that we don't have, um, have to um, get caught unprepared for another pandemic in the healthcare industry, you know, has taken some valuable time, important investment, the way we invested that time, um, but it's, um, but, you know, it has, it has set back some of our other important health related rulemaking. And certainly people can see the theme here on the things that we are needing to prioritize and elevate. General ladies, I, Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to recognize the ranking member. Of Hello? The Hello? Oh, yes. I yes. yes. I'm in, uh, can you yeah, make, I wanted uh, to. Um, can you well, I'm in. Uh, Judy, you got to be on mute. I wanted to use my Judy, miles. Yeah. To, Representative uh, Judy. You need Judy. to mute. Representative Chu. Okay. All right. Uh, I want to recognize the ranking member of the uh, Education and, and Labor Committee, uh, Dr. Fox, you recognize, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Parker, despite repeated warnings from the committee and legal experts about the limits on OSHA's authority, the Labor Department d doubled down on the illegal vaccine and testing mandate, causing massive confusion for employers and threatening workers' personal medical decisions. OSHA now lists a whopping 28 planned regulatory action in the most recent agenda. What assurances can you provide that these regulations will be lawful? What safeguards are in place to ensure that massive regulatory overreach from OSHA will not threaten workers and job creators again? Well, I um, thank you, um, uh, Ranking Member. I, I, um, I certainly take seriously as, as does the solicitor and the secretary the importance of making sure that all of our actions um, are legal and supported uh, by the Administrative Procedures Act, that our regulations are supported by evidence in the record and that they are, um, that they are supported by substantial evidence. And we'll continue to work to do that. Certainly in the case of, um, of the vaccine and testing rule, uh, we did believe that we were on, um, on solid legal ground based upon the scale of the, of the challenges and the scale of the pandemic and ongoing tragedy that we were experiencing. The, the, um, you know, the, the Supreme Court ruled otherwise, of course, and that's always, you know, that at times is gonna be the case in these issues that involve complex legal questions. And so we can't guarantee that in every case, um, our rules will be sustained or some aspect, but we'll certainly, we certainly operate in good faith and absolutely take seriously um, the need to be committed to the rule of law and how we move forward in our business. 
Thank you for that Dr. commitment. Dr. We certainly are going to hold you to that. And uh, we will express our opinions if we feel like you are not issuing lawful regulations. Uh, Mr. Parker OSHA appropriately allowed the COVID-19 emergency temporary standard for the healthcare industry to expire at the end of 2021, but the agency is currently pursuing a final and permanent COVID-19 healthcare industry standard. Uh, the Biden administration seems intent on using the pandemic as an excuse to exert more federal control over people in the workplace. With the pandemic coming to an end, is it time for OSHA to stop exert, exerting new powers? Well, the powers that we're um, currently using um, with respect to COVID-19 are within our traditional authority. Um, the the COVID-19 healthcare rule, uh, you know, our emergency temporary standard by law operates as a proposed rule, and so. We have to move forward on that and make it, you know, ultimately make a decision about whether to make it permanent. And we are have initiated that rulemaking or committed to doing something quickly. We think that it's important to have a rule certainly by the fall. And, and our, our focus with respect to our COVID-19 activities, whether it's our focused inspections that we're doing right now in healthcare, our national emphasis program, or our COVID-19 or our infectious disease rule. Those are really focused on readiness and putting employers and workers in a position to be prepared for future eventualities and future dangers. So fewer workers die or, or um, their families are affected by this, this tragic uh, um, disease or, or other future infections. Well, I was in a healthcare facility yesterday and that was the only thing they wanted to talk about were the absolutely unrealistic rules uh, put out by OSHA, particularly as they relate to masks. Uh, Mr. Parker, the president's budget requested a massive 49% increase for OSHA's office in charge of devising and writing regulations and the agency's plans to pursue an aggressive regulatory agent agenda. Has the administration considered the impact that dozens of new regulations will have on our nation's job creators and workers in the struggling Biden economy? Uh, absolutely, uh, Dr. Fox. We always consider um, the, the burden on um, employers and the cost in all of the rulemaking that we do. Um, we, we take very seriously that, um, that factor. We certainly don't think that there is a, um, you know, that we have to have an either or situation where we have to choose between good jobs and, and safety and health protection for, for, for workers. And that's the approach that we take. Uh, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to uh, thank all of the witnesses for, are, are there other members who may have joined the platform who um, have not been heard? Okay, we're gonna proceed then. Uh, I want to, uh, first of all, thank the witnesses for their testimony. Uh, I want to remind my colleagues that pursuant to committee practice, materials for submission for the hearing record must be submitted to the committee clerk within 14 days following the last day of the hearing. Uh, so by close of business on June 8th, uh, uh, preferably in Microsoft Word format, the materials submitted uh, must address the subject matter of the hearing and only a member of the subcommittee or an invited witness may submit materials for inclusion in the hearing record. Documents are limited to 50 pages each. Uh, no documents longer than 50 pages will be incorporated into the record via an internet link that you must provide to the committee clerk within the required time frame. But please recognize that in the future, that link may no longer work. Pursuant to house rules and regulations, items for the record should be submitted to the clerk electronically by emailing submissions to ed and later uh, hearings at mail.house.gov. Uh, again, I want to thank the witnesses for their participation today. Uh, members of the subcommittee may have some additional questions for you. And we ask the witnesses to please respond to those questions in writing. The hearing record will be held open for 14 days in order to receive those responses. 
I remind my colleagues that pursuant to committee practice, uh, witness questions uh, for the hearing record must be submitted to the majority committee staff or committee clerk within seven days. The question submitted must address the subject matter of the hearing. Uh, I'd now like to recognize the distinguished ranking member for a closing statement, ranking member Keller. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and, and I'd like to thank the witnesses for participating in today's hearing. As we've heard throughout today's hearing, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration plays an important role in ensuring America's workers are safe and healthy. Committee Republicans support enforcement of the Occupational Safety Health Act and common sense policies that protect workers. OSHA works best when engaging cooperatively with employers through compliance assistance and other efforts to protect employees before an injury or illness can occur. I know firsthand uh, from, the, from the people I have the privilege to represent, the employers, job creators in Pennsylvania's 12th Congressional District, that they care deeply about keeping uh, their team members, the people that come to work every day, safe. Unfortunately, time and time again, Democrats in Congress and this administration demonize our job creators. If President Biden's budget request for OSHA and the agency's egregious overreach during the COVID pandemic are any indication of this administration's priorities, I'm afraid businesses and their employees can expect more of the same. We should reject this approach and we will continue to hold OSHA accountable. Thank you and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Keller. Uh, I now recognize uh, myself for a, the purpose of making my closing statement. I do want to again thank our witnesses for being with us today. Uh, OSHA's safety standard and enforcement play a critical role in protecting workers on the job and ensuring that they come home safely. Unfortunately, the agency was missing in action during the worst safety crisis, COVID-19, in OSHA's history. As a result, the Biden administration has have been left to make up for the Trump administration's inaction while also working to advance the agency to protect employees in the 21st century workplace. To ensure OSHA has the tools to fulfill its mission, Congress must update the Occupational Safety and Health Act and provide OSHA with the resources it needs. Moving forward, I'm committed to working with my colleagues to advance meaningful science-based legislation that invests in and strengthens uh, workplace safety for our nation's workers. So, Again, thank you to our witnesses uh, for your time and testimony. Thank you to all of my colleagues as well uh, for being with us today and for your participation. If there is no further business without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you.